Hey, welcome, everyone. My name is Alex Bain. I'll be introducing the speaker today. Uh, so first, I want to thank um, Infion to, uh, for sponsoring the lunch. And I want to say hi to our web viewer, as usual, with the uh, lectures of Citrus. If you're watching us uh, from the other Citrus campuses, uh, you can IM uh, us your questions, and they will be typed, and they will be read to the speaker at the end of the talk. Uh, also, a couple announcements. Uh, the tier workshop will be this Friday on, uh, and Saturday. Um, you can grab some flyers. They are in the back, so they should look something like this. Just grab one if you're interested. Um, also, a couple other announcements. The next uh, Nokia Distinguished Lecture on Cyberphysical Systems will be on October 21st. We'll have Professor Miroslav Kristic from UCSD. And in fact, following this, um, the Citrus um, uh, building will be the host uh, institution for the launch of the Mobile Millennium, which will happen on November 10th uh, from this room here. So uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce um, today's speaker, Professor Rajas and Gupta uh, from the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. Um, Raja got his uh, bachelor from uh, Jadavpur, I'm sorry if I mispronounced, uh, University in Calcutta in 1988. Uh, his master's and PhD from Michigan in uh, 1991 and 1995. He has been a professor at uh, UC since 2002 in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, where he's now an associate professor. And prior to that, he was a research engineer at PATH from 1995 to 2001, where he worked on establishing a fantastic test bed on the in, in the communication lab on wireless problems, in particular uh, between cars. And I think that's some of what we're going to hear uh, today. So Raja has mainly two uh, main activities that he's been leading in the department uh, over the years. One of them is this uh, vehicle coordination and control activities that we're going to hear about today. And the other one is the fabulous UAV project that he's been leading. In particular, I think they have some applications where they uh, control UAV UAVs from an iPhone, and that even made the front page of the Wired magazine uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so I hope we're going to hear about this as well. So please uh, join me in welcoming Rajas and Gupta for the talk today. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. You're too kind. Um, is the mic working OK? All right. And hi, everybody on the web. I'll try and remember to look at the camera once in a while. Um, OK, so I thought I'd talk about um, you know, my understanding of uh, what's going on with wireless networks for cars. And it's, um, it's an area, you know, where there's, of course, a lot of action from different fields. And I actually came at it from the, I came at it from the transportation side. Um, so before I was doing wireless, I was doing more transportation. And, you know, like Alex said that I did do this, uh, you know, sort of this wireless network testbed stuff while I was at PAC. But before that, I was working on automated highway systems. So I came at it from the transportation side and then gradually, you know, uh, understood the rest of it. Very multidisciplinary field, and that's, that's, that's actually the main uh, uh, issue in my talk. So in the transportation world, this was a big deal, right? So... Um, the Federal Communications Commission on, um, in 99 allocated 75 megahertz of spectrum, ruling with all kinds of good words, said, you know, increase traveler safety, reduce fuel consumption, pollution, and continue to advance the nation's economy. And moreover, they made this stuff free. You know, they, they said, it'll, you know, you can do it without licensing fees or very nominal licensing fees of industry wants, but no auction for billions of dollars because transportation is such a vital sector of the economy and, you know, safety is a public good and all that sort of good stuff, right? So uh, they did the preliminary ruling in 1999, and then they actually ruled preliminary, gave preliminary licensing rules based on input from the industry in 2003. And uh, 75 megahertz of spectrum, 5.9 gigahertz. So the basic idea, you know, and this was done under petition from uh, ITS America, Intelligent Transportation Systems Society of America, which is the main trade and industry association for intelligent transportation systems, right? Sort of the IT revolution inside transportation and uh, under request from the U.S. Department of Transportation which recognized this as a strategic move. And so the idea was that, you know, let's get radios into cars, let's get radios on the, on the road, and move lots of useful information around. Now, this is a little cartoon that I've picked up from the um, VII website. So US DOT created what's called the Vehicle Infrastructure Initiative, Integration Initiative, as their way of capitalizing on the spectrum. And I'll tell you about it. And this is a cartoon. If you go to their website today, this is the sort of thing that you'll see there. So when I said, you know, move lots of useful information around, here's the sort of headings that they break it up in. 
commercial vehicles, traffic management, intersection stuff, tolling, e-payments, transit vehicle safety. And let's just take a quick look at what some of this stuff is. So here's a graph from MitreTech, a former employee of mine, which is sort of like considered a think tank to the Intelligent Transportation Joint Programs Office. And they're big on traffic management. There's a great guy called Carl Wunderlich there whose, whose view graph this is. We did our PhDs together. And um, basically, the traffic management stuff is about, you know, we want to estimate travel time. We want to estimate the queues at intersections, how long you're going to have to wait, you know, is there an accident on your way? Should you be given some kind of diversion information as you're traveling? All that sort of stuff, right? But basically, in terms of information or data, it boils down, you know, data moving over the network, it essentially boils down to GPS positions. So that's what he's showing you here. In the trajectory of a vehicle, maybe we got a GPS uh, measurement over there, you know, the vehicle sent out its GPS, and it sent another one there, and another one there, and another one, and, you know, from this kind of, uh, these points in space and time, we want to reconstruct everything. And this is called probe data, right? And so, essentially, you go to the traffic management side of this VII thing, and what they're talking about is probe data. The moving of GPS data that shows up at one, one to five hertz, I guess. I mean, one hertz mostly, right? Now, if you look at the intersection stuff, out of the ton of Fairbanks Research Center, right, which is part of the Federal Highway Administration, one of the five arms of USDOT, there's a big intersection initiative. They call this Cooperative Intersection Collision Avoidance. This is a view graph for one of their program managers. And this is sort of showing you why the traffic light would want to broadcast to the vehicle. So the traffic light would send it a signal phase and timing message. This is when I'm turning green, I'm red now, et cetera, et cetera. It's called a SPAC message. The vehicle will get this and presumably do clever reasoning like this, right? That I'm likely to run through, I better warn my driver, whatever, 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 right? And then here, you're seeing actually, this is sort of showing you the other side of it, that uh, the intersection, you can see this, uh, this little sign here, right? Which is telling the driver, this bus driver in this case, do not turn left because there's a pedestrian crossing the road. And so this is an example of now the, the intersection. Uh, instead of the vehicle warning the driver, it's the intersection issuing warnings to the driver. And the intersection in that case needs to be intelligent enough to learn about what's going on around it. Right? And you could either do this by installing sensors on the roadside, which will detect cars and pedestrians, or these days you could do it by using wireless communications, with the idea being that vehicles will have GPS and wireless, FCC has allocated DSRC. We're going to get a DSRC radio into every car. Every car will be, will be able to send out its position. We no longer need to install expensive sensors in the pavement. GPS and Wi-Fi and DSRC is so cheap, et cetera, et cetera. And this is how these intelligent in intersections will be enabled. That is actually the specific idea in this project. That's why this program is called the Cooperative Intersection Collision Avoidance uh, Program. Cooperative. Cooperative in the transportation parlance refers to communication-based systems, right? And these pictures you're seeing are actually, for those of you who, some of you might recognize it, are the Richmond Field Station. These are the great eucalyptus trees on, you know, one side of it. So we've got actually a big piece of this CCAS project at Berkeley, and I'm PI of it. Um, and uh, now the safety side, right? In terms of this vehicle safety stuff, with you know, sort of cars talking to cars and avoiding collisions and stuff like that. Now this is where the automotive OEMs came in a big way. Right? So when the OEMs showed up, they basically said, well, we're interested in is safety. Safety sells, and you know, this is what we do, this is what ABS is, this is what traction control systems is. People pay a lot of money when they buy their cars for safety systems, et cetera, et cetera. Safety is a biggie. And so they created something called the Vehicle Safety Communications Consortium. They got together with the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, some public dollars, some private dollars, and created this consortium, which then issued a final report, um, I think about a year and a half ago, and, or maybe a year ago, which basically kind of summarizes from their point of view what they think are the requirements and what kind of things they're talking about. And you're seeing this sort of thing here, right? It's sort of telling you that, well, you know, we'd like maybe a curved speed warning. So this is, think of this as the yellow sign that's on the curve as you're going by, but now it might send out a message and tell your car, that uh, the, curve, the posted speed on this curve is 35 miles an hour or whatever, the advised speed on this curve. A traffic signal violation, emergency electronic brake lights is one they consider rather near term, where uh, you know, a car in front brakes hard and it sends out an emergency electronic brake light message. Right? So think of it as brake lights but over, over, over wireless. And then cooperative forward collision warning is a big one. And uh, I'm, I'm going to say a little bit more about that. But you can see what they're roughly saying is that, you know, they think that this, uh, this pre-crash sensing stuff, uh, this one is very special. It's got very low latency because they're what they, and they view that as very futuristic. They're basically, you know, saying something like, 
Um, you know, uh, we want a very short range communications link when collision is practically imminent so that you know, we can very accurately know what the other car is doing in order to properly dynamically uh, inflate bumpers and tension belts and door panels and stuff like that. Right? But they haven't really done much work on that. But this cooperative forward collision warning is a big one. So I'm going to leave that out. But roughly what this picture is then telling you is that the tightest latency requirements are about 100 milliseconds. So they're saying that when we're looking at this, all this you know, mm, wireless technologies, we would like messages to be delivered within 100 milliseconds. Right? So that's what they're looking at. There's also a range number here, right? because range, I mean, the, the louder we shout, the fewer the people who can talk at the same time. So that affects capacity. But uh, you can see things can go up to 300 meters. Right? At the outset, a lot of stuff is about 150 meters or so. Right? So that's kind of the numbers to take away from this. Now, this cooperative collision warning stuff, well, we'll hmm. what's happening here? I wish, yeah, I wish it worked the other way. It's showing up beautifully on my machine. Um, I wish it was blank here and showing up there. Okay, let's try it this way and see. Um, never, ah, now it shows up, right? So, and now it doesn't. Yeah, I th say what? Okay, um, let me get out of the slideshow mode, I guess, if I can get this machine to respond to me, and then I can just try this. Okay, we'll just look at it like this. Oh no, same problem. As soon as it starts playing. Sorry? You won't be able to see it from there. This is, I have never had this problem happen. Anyway, okay. I, I hope it doesn't happen with the other movies. It's going to destroy, it's going to take away a lot of the value of the presentation. So, um, so with, the, with, the, with, the, with the cooperative collision warning stuff, right, what we, what we essentially did was, um, I'm wondering if it's because I used a different mode this time than I've used before. Um, can you, do you think you can figure out how to reset it back to that uh, mode I was using before? Somehow it's, it's, it's not letting me do it because it's saying that, uh, okay, and meanwhile, I'll just explain what, what this is about. So the, um, the, the basic idea of this cooperative collision warning stuff, right, and what this movie uh, is trying to show you is that back in 2004, we built uh, you know, one of the first prototypes. So General Motors came to us and said that, look, you know, we've been putting radar on all these cars, radar in the front, radar in the back, radar in the side, you know, et cetera, because threats to cars come from all directions. And they're saying you know, the, 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 the cost of radar is not coming down sufficiently fast for us. So we're looking at thousands of dollars to equip a vehicle with enough radar for 360 degree awareness. Right? Now suddenly, of course, you know, this was back in 2004, Wi-Fi had started showing up in everybody's home. And you know, they suddenly started believing that, well, maybe Wi-Fi on a, you know, on a large proportion of the vehicle fleet could be a reality. So they came up with this idea of cooperative collision warning, and they wanted to know that if you used 802.11b, which was the dominant technology at that time, uh, would it be possible for this stuff to work? Right? And so essentially the idea there is that every vehicle sends out its GPS position. Right? And over, over Wi Fi. And I know my own. So the car in front is sending me its GPS position. I know my own GPS position. I difference the two. Right? And that's how I know that whether this car is in front of me or not. And if it's braking hard, etc., I figure it out from that. So basically, I use this stuff to build a map of all my neighboring vehicles. And then, based on that map, we issue warnings and collisions to the drivers. And here at Berkeley, we uh, were we built, I believe, the first prototype that was able to deliver warnings to drivers at sub-second time scales, because the because if a car breaks hard, right in front, you basically want the information to get to the driver behind. The driver behind should receive a warning within 500 milliseconds of that event occurring. Okay, because the fastest, the most attentive people within about seven, at, may figure out it's happening themselves unaided at about 700 milliseconds. So you want to be beneath that because, at, because by then if it hasn't said anything, then the, then the driver might say, what a dumb system. I figured it out and the system didn't. So because it's 500 milliseconds and you know, there's lots of computing involved in order to produce such a warning, 
you want the communication latencies to be one order of magnitude smaller than that. Right? So if the warning fails, it's not because of the communication system. It's because of some complicated Markov decision processing to figure out whether this vehicle is really a threat or something like that. Right? So, um, Hmm? We're still having problems with it? Yeah. Okay, we'll just move on and hope Maybe for the best. Um, yeah, we're still having... There are several movies like this, so I hope it doesn't happen with all of them. I, I wonder... Anyway, we'll see. We'll see. If it well, happens, no, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it. Your presentation. I have a laptop that will work. You just no, don't worry about okay. it. Let's just go on. Let's just go on. So... What I was trying to say is that, you know, the, that this cooperative forward collision warning business, right, when you look at this list of applications, this cooperative forward collision warning, which is about giving you warnings from collisions in all directions. So if we'd seen that movie, you'd have seen forward collision warnings, you'd have seen intersection collision warnings, you're standing at a traffic light, you'd have seen warnings for vehicles in your blind spot, right? So all that different sort of stuff. So it's this, it's this one thing that gives you all these different kinds of warnings. And this one actually can be a biggie in terms of, it can be a real bandwidth hog. Because you think about it, you know, let's say the vanilla imp implementation would be every 100 milliseconds, every car sends out its GPS position. Right? So if you, if you do the math, you look at kind of the density of vehicles at maximum flow and do all this stuff, it'll turn out that if you have perfect scheduling, right, if you have perfect scheduling on the channel, that is, you know, we're all in this room and you say, you're number one, you're number two, you're number three, you're number four, you're number five, which is, of course, very difficult to do in a place where cars are continuously moving in and out. A vehicle would be able to talk every 85 milliseconds, right? Which is, of course, under the 100 milliseconds, that's fine, but you don't have perfect scheduling. So there's a whole bunch of simulations and all that that actually show that if you do try to do every 100 millisecond communication at a range of 150 meters or 300 meters, you lose something like over 30% of your messages. Right? And, you, and this is simulations on a 20 megahertz Wi-Fi channel. Okay? So that one's a biggie. I mean, it's not sort of easy to say, you know, let's just deal with that in some way. There's been a lot of work on this stuff, and this is one of the fields that I've worked a lot in, but I'm not going to talk about it uh, that much today. And all this, you know, the reason to do all this collision warning came out of lots of research by NHTSA, which essentially argued, you know, this was uh, from NHTSA's report to Congress back in 1995, where, you know, NHTSA essentially argued that, you know, the sorts of uh, crashes which are caused by, you know, I was turning and my steering wheel got stuck, and that's why it went off, you know, went off the road, you know, have practically disappeared into the noise, right? I mean, I guess maybe this was when Ralph Nader made so much noise about this stuff that they fixed all this stuff. So essentially now it's all our fault. 76% of the crashes are because we're, we're changing CDs when we shouldn't be, we're trying to quieten the kid in the back when we shouldn't be, and blah, 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 blah. Right? So all this sort of stuff, and that's what all these collision warning problems are uh, directed at. Now, so uh, this one, you know, the cooperative collision warning here is a biggie. These, I think, are not that hard to do. In commercial vehicles and tolling and e-payments, right, that is another potentially difficult one. So tolling, you know, so the, so the thing about the safety stuff is that it's broadcast, right? When I send out my GPS, then uh, I send it out for everybody. All the cars around me just get that stuff in one shot. The tolling stuff, on the other hand, is much more unicast, right? It's, it's a one-to-one it's a, it's a -one communication because your credit card is going to be charged for, you know, crossing the bridge. And uh, so it better be directed at you and not at everybody else. So, and, and these communications have to be very fast because we want to do these while cars are driving by. And one also wants very high reliability. You don't want to toll the guy in the opposite direction, you know, because you somehow picked up his signal wrongly or there was some GPS error or something like that, right? So current RFID tolling systems that we use in the Bay Bridge have very, very low failure rates, right? Like the probability of being wrongly told is like one part in a billion or something like that. And the probability of not being told is a little bit higher, but it's still like one in a million or something like that when you, when you go through. So it's very, uh, very, very uh, reliable things. So given that, you know, there are these problems that are sort of challenging, what the whole transportation DSRC community tried to do was they tried to standardize solutions to new networking problems. Right? And this is where the difficulty started. So what people did is, you know, in, in, in the usual Wi-Fi world, we of course have a multi-channel system in, in, in Wi-Fi. We have a multi-channel model. But what we do is we, we spread the users across the channels. And we put all the applications on all the channels. So if this is an internet server putting out YouTube. It's available to the people using the shell, the access point of the shell gas station on channel number six. And it's available to the Starbucks people on channel number four. 
Right? So it's sort of like all applications are on all channels, and we spread the users across channels, and users do this by choosing SSIDs, and they associate, and there's a delay in that process when you scan channels, associate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here, on the other hand, in the DSRC world, what people started doing was they said, no, 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 we're going to move away from this model. We're going to take the applications and we'll spread them across the channels. We'll spread applications across channels. So unlike YouTube, available on every channel, here, the traffic light sending out its signal phase and timing message is on the green channel. And the watch out message from the cars are coming on the, on the blue channel. And whatever information's coming from the gas station about electronic payment or whatever is on the pink channel. Right? So we'll spread applications across channels. Right? Now once you do this, then you get into problems like, you know, I am on the pink channel when the car in front of me says, watch out for me. Right? So how do I, what do I do? How do I get that message? So then you've got to switch channels fast. You've got to solve scheduling problems, right? et cetera, et cetera. And there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff you know, that's mostly in a standard called IEEE 1609 that started getting involved in order to deal with these problems. And then, of course, there's also some security stuff, which I don't understand very well. But uh, because um, essentially, you know, we're breaking the Wi-Fi association model. So they need a new security model that works fast you know, without long association. So et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, and I must say, there are a bunch of people who argue about this delay. Right? For instance, Yasser sitting here who's working in my group has been saying that the delay actually is all about channel scanning. If you preset the channel, then you don't have so much delay. Right? But anyway, people said, Wi-Fi is bad. It doesn't work. This is what we're going to do, and started inventing new standards. Initially, of course, things moved fast. So Spectrum was allocated in 99. And actually, the transportation industry kind of got its act together and in 2001 said, Let's do the wise thing. Let's base this new spectrum on a technology that's going to be produced in the, in the, in the millions of pieces. Right? So they voted to base this DSRC on, on the 802.11 chipset. And, you know, and I was in the room when this standard vote happened. And you know, the day before, it really worked because this guy from Atheros, Shang Li, showed up with this chip. Because every, everybody, you know, there was a group of people, in, including me, who was saying standardize it based on 802.11. And then pe people were saying, I cannot base my business on a standard for which there is no chip. Right? I mean, it doesn't exist. OFDN doesn't exist. We can't do it. And then you know, he shows up with this chipset, and people said, is this real? He said, yes, it's my company's product. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to sell it in, in the millions. And the next day, OFDN won the ballot. Right? So it's a 20 to 2 ballot. Uh, there were two votes against. And so this what happened in 2001. And Atheros in 2001 actually did start shipping these chipsets in, in, in volume. And they were supporting 5.9 gigahertz. Some of the DSRC people said that Wi-Fi has 20 megahertz channels, but we want 10 megahertz channels. And they did actually support that here. Right? And people wanted to switch channels. And they did actually also open up ways to do fast channel, channel switching. So you could write drivers that would do fast, uh, fast, fast channel switching on the, on the radio. So these things happened. And then on the, on the other side, the US Department of Transportation launched the VII program that I talked to you about and said that this is the grand plan. We're going to build 250,000 access points on the roadside at 5.9 gigahertz that will cover the major thoroughfares of the nation. And you know, there was a sense of mission that after many, many years, ever since we built the interstate highway system, we're building again. Right? And this time, instead of rolling out a national highway system, they want to roll out a national communications network. Right? And this is USDOT. And you know, as a matter of fact, 20 of that 250,000 was actually has been built by Berkeley, the PATH program at Berkeley, and it operates on El Camino Real, and it actually sends out these messages. So if you can find one of these DSRC radios and put it in your car, it'll actually tell you stuff like the speed limit on El Camino Real is 35 miles an hour, and you can do what you like with that piece of information. <laughs> okay, and so while we've been waiting for V2X wireless on road and car, right? The same chipset, the 802.11a chipset, enabled this box that's in my house. And it was supposed to enable that box, which is the DSRC box. And this is now there in the millions. Whereas DSRC today, seven years later, we have 20 in California, 57 in Michigan, and a few in New York that we are planning to use in November. Right? Same chipset. So seven years from chip to radio is a long time in Silicon Valley. Right? I've been in this game long enough to know that I'm afraid now is DSRC, you know, I mean, stuff becomes yesterday's news, right? I mean, the wireless spectrum moves so fast. There's now 802.11m. People are talking about ultra-wideband. By the time we get around to this, they'll say, ah, there's OFDM, 802.11a. Too slow, too slow. We don't care, right? Who knows? 
So should we change course? Caltrans says an informed traveler is a safe and efficient traveler. Caltrans slogan, they're my major sponsor, right? What we care about is information, right? So I think, okay. So while, you know, US DOD car companies, et cetera, have been doing DSRC, there's something that happened, okay? And this is my attempt to create a dramatic picture. There's an elephant in the room that we've all missed, those of us who came at it from the transportation side. And I think it's called the mobile internet, right? So this is the new thing that happened. And this is a picture from my colleague here, Alex Bayan, who I think was the first person who saw it coming, um, at least in my circle. In the, uh, and, you know, and Quinn and Alex you know, sort of did this thing where they essentially they, they just said that, look, I, there are these mobile phones. And I'm going to use these things to send what all the US DOT people call probe data, GPS data, over 3G. And they put 100 cars out there. You've heard this in the Citrus seminar series. They put 100 cars out there. And they could suddenly do this at a larger scale and a lower cost than anybody had done this before. And the media, I guess if you go to Alex's website, right, there's a whole long list of little TV channels and radio channels and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera that showed up there. The media just love it. So I sit back, you know, and I start thinking that uh, why, why, why is this such a hit? Why is it such a hit? This VII and 250,000 access points and 20 in Michigan, uh, 20 in California, if you're going on for a long time, suddenly this guy a big hit. So first I think, oh, it's because, it's, it's because of all this PDE stuff. The American public has fallen in love with partial differential equations. <laughs> but, then I, but then I thought, you know, for all, this, for all our best efforts, this is a country where people think Michael Jordan is a basketball player, right? In spite of, you know, whatever we may do in the computer science department. So, so I, I decided that it's, this, this is not the PDEs. And then it hit me. The mobile internet is big, right? It's big. People think what, it, what the message that they sent is that, look, this stuff, real-time information for traffic based on GPS, it's for you. It's for us. It's for my mama, right? Because it's here. Everybody's got a phone, right? And I think, and that to my understanding is what did it. And we hit some of this too, you know, like in, in, in my UAV research that Alex was referring to, we, you know, uh, did so much stuff, right? But the thing that hit the news finally, all the tech blogs, Wired and Engadget and Gizmodo and all that, was when we used an iPhone to control a UAV. Suddenly we were big news, right? Berkeley uses iPhone to control UAV. Don't tell Steve Jobs. Right, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, I mean, you've all seen this sort of stuff, right? That these smartphones are skyrocketing. And the mobile internet, of course, is not just the internet plus cell phones, right? In my understanding, the cell phone world is actually much bigger, much bigger than the internet. And, you know, one is sort of looking for a convergence of these two things. And it's, so it's not just phones, but it's also all the stuff going along with it, right? That is helping you move content around, put it into the internet. You can stream your, your video out of your phone as you're taking it if you've installed the quick client, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's all this sort of stuff. So while we've been waiting for DSRC, right, to put wireless into the car, today there's this that has happened, right? In some sense, I can say you take your iPhone, you put it in your pocket, you enter your car, your car now has Wi-Fi. <coughs> Right? And it's an issue of how do we make that link real, how do we know that it's actually in the car, et cetera, et cetera. There's all that stuff, but maybe there are simple solutions to these problems. And as a matter of fact, to the credit of those who run our government, um, the super tanker is turning. So you can see here that this huge $100 million VII program right, says, this is a slide, recent slide pulled off their website, previous approach, current approach, deployment decision by OEMs, US DOT, et cetera. There's no Nokia in there, there's no Apple in there, nobody in there, key technology DSRC. Here on the other hand, open up the architecture, read mobile internet, work with aftermarket suppliers, read smartphones, the phone industry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And they say that it's inspired by Japan, the Japan Smartway project, because, because the Japanese guys, right, they, uh, the, you know, because they managed to build something. Right, what they did was that, you know, they, you know, like in, 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 they, they just rolled this infrastructure out on the roadside. They made these little units called VICs, Vehicle Infrastructure Communication System, available in vehicles. And you're seeing photographs here of, you know, this is one of the VICs units on the Smartway in Japan. And Paul Brubacher, who's the, who's the head of USDOT research, went to Japan, saw this stuff and said, look, it's happening there. People are using it there. It's, it's in people's hands. It's not test beds of size 20 and size 57, 
right? Why can't this happen in my country? Right? So they say that this sort of uh, is motivated in that way. But I think actually, while we want what Japan has done, I think we should do it differently. I don't think we should do it the Japanese way. And we might end up doing it for cheaper because we've just been later. So I think that the new approach should actually be the old way. That you put all these applications and stuff, but you join the internet. Right? So you, instead of in, inventing you know, one's own communication technology for all the transportation wireless, one should basically go join the internet. And this is, the, this is what I want to talk about the rest of my time. Right? So you put all these technologies under it and make it work under IP. And this is actually to, you know, in order to strengthen my case, I want to say that this is what the Europeans have actually been doing. So they have a whole bunch of EU mega projects. They call it Network on Wheels and CVIS. This is actually from the director. This is a slide from the director of the CVA, CVA, CVIS program. And you know what? essentially, they always took the view that, all, that what they need to enable is a layer of middleware that you know, offers standard functions like you know, functionality like security, connection management, uh, inner networking, et cetera, et cetera, right? data marshaling and stuff like that. And they'll build on top of that. So they have not tied themselves to a particular communications technology. Rather, what they're doing is building a layer of uh, middleware on top of it. And of course, you know, when you do the old way, right, there's a loss of optimality. Because if I were to build a protocol and wireless spectrum, specifically radio for this application, I could do all kinds of cross-layer design and really optimize the hell of it. But the advantage one would get out of you know, this inefficiency, of course, is, the, is DSRC may rise or fall, but the information, the application, should survive. And it should, it should reach the consumer. And you won't get quality of service, right? The, I mean, IP has never successfully delivered that. And we'll waste bandwidth, et cetera. But the big advantage of it is that it'll be out there. So I think that this new approach, right, it needs new friends. And this is my little cartoon, right? So this is the transportation executive who traditionally deals with the car company, right? I'm your old friend, the car company. And now here's the new friend. My name is iPhone. And we have to have this convergence of these two industries, one of which has traditionally worked with the US Department of Transportation. And this is a difficult thing to achieve. And uh, so, now, welcome to what we're doing about it. It's called the Connected Traveler Program. Okay, and there are two projects inside here, one of which is Mobile Millennium, which is led by my colleague Alex Bayan here, and the other one is GEMS, which I am uh, part of. And I'm gonna talk about GEMS, right? So, the GEMS idea is, that we create a website called networktraveler.org. Okay? So get yourself a smartphone and go to networktraveler.org. What networktraveler.org does is you can choose what information you want to put in and what information you want to take out. So here's a closer blow up of it. If you're on the safety tab, for instance, you can say something like that when I am out on the road, right, I want to send out a watch out for me message. When I'm crossing the road, I'm a pedestrian, I'm crossing the road, I'm in a crosswalk, it's got a button that enables me to, in any case, create a sign, to activate a sign, but you know what? The statistics show 38% of the intersection crash pedestrian deaths at intersections in California happen in a crosswalk with a button, with a traffic light, with everything, right? And 34% happen in mid-block crosswalks without all this stuff. So, um, so you can, you can choose here. You can say that, well, when I'm out there, I want to send out such a message. I think I need longer to cross the street. I'm less attentive. I'm a kid. I'm whatever. I, need, I want to send this out. You can also say that, oh, when I'm driving, I want to receive information about pedestrians. Or you can say, no, I don't want this stuff. I think it's a nuisance. I drive well enough. I don't want this stuff. Right? You can do the same sort of thing for vehicles. So, uh, so this is basically the, so you get onto the Network Traveler website, and you choose what kind of information you want to receive and what kind of information you want to send. Right? And then what you do is you go out into the world with your smartphone in your pocket. Right? And this is what is currently functioning at a prototype level. So one part of it is right, basically doing things to plan your trip. So this is a, this is a transit trip planner that a couple of students from the systems program, Dan Work and uh, Jerry, Jerry Asunanth have created. It works on the iPhone. So you can, I'm not going to play the movie. It basically, uh, you can get on there and you, know, you can say, this is where I'm starting and this is where I want to go. And it's got all the AC transit and Muni schedules. And it's also got the real time bus information of how the bus is moving. And it'll tell you, your bus is coming in two minutes. Right? So you can sort of say that, oh, oh, the bus is late. I can sit in my office for an extra two minutes before I, before I get out there. Right? And if we, uh, 
Uh, oh, we've got a few minutes. This, this one's actually funny. So let's see if we can, uh, is it going to do the same thing now? It's going to do exactly the same thing. It's already playing on, on my machine. Yeah, OK. We'll try to look at it. OK. Uh, and uh, we're not getting the audio, I think, but that's probably because I have it turned off. Because the audio is funny. These guys are naturals. Uh. So we've got our GPS location on our N810. And then we're about to plan a trip from here to, let's say, Berkeley Bowl. So mm. there's a couple different routes that we can take. We can take the F or the 18, actually. And we're going to see what's the fastest according to our planner. So I'm going to hit submit you here because I'm going to hit submit 8, 8, 8, on our actually. current location, then drag this red dot to where I want to go. So that's about Berkeley Bowl. So let's say yes, let's go there. And it's going to go and load. And we're going to figure out what's the best way to get there right now. Um, in the meantime, this is connected right now. Should we say through the that thing? Yeah, so it's connected via Bluetooth to an N95 with an internet uh, SIM card on it. So that's why it's kind of a bit slow, but hopefully we'll get our results soon. So right now what it's doing, it's talking to our web server that's in our office right now. And the web server is doing the calculations, and here it goes. It's loading our next possible bus. So it's saying, hey, we should take the 18 that's coming in three minutes at the corner of Shattuck and Kittredge. So let's go. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming in three minutes. So I have this job in here. <laughs> and so they did, you know, they did actually make their trip. <laughs> they managed to successfully pick it up. So, um, you know, so, so this is one of the f facilities, right? An example of one of the facilities available under the, uh, the thing. And, uh, and then, you know, there is also a regular driving planner, right, into which we're trying to integrate a lot of different kinds of content. So it tells you the fastest route. It might tell you the safest route. This is based on, on basically historical accident data, the safest stuff, which is now publicly available because of new laws that have been passed. And uh, so, you know, you can choose between these different modes. And the reason we're doing this is because, because, because we want to put out this idea that, look, if we look at the content that we use when we travel, it's very rich. Individually, there's not much that I use. But if we look collectively between all of us at the set of information that we use, it's almost as diverse as society itself. So the network traveler approach is to say that, look, that the box model isn't going to work. Collectively, we use so much content that I can never imagine building a box that will hold all that content. The application model provided by a company probably won't work either, because how can I get one company to source me all this content? So the network traveler approach is more of the iGoogle approach, the Google approach, where you look at it as, we'll, what we'll build is a platform that connects producers of content with the consumers of content. So when you get onto the website and you say that I want this kind of content, it's not necessarily produced by the researchers at Berkeley. Right? It's produced by partners in the connected traveler program with the eventual idea being that this becomes a nice set of APIs and all that, sort of like Google Gadgets, where you can easily put in things, but it's that kind of thing built for the transportation world. Right? And that's sort of the, the idea behind here. And then, so this, this sort of stuff was, was about trip planning, but then what happens is that what, you know, once you set things up on your website, etc., plan your trip, if you take your trip, then when you're sitting in the bus, you can get information of this kind if you've signed up for it. So it'll tell you that you know, your bus stop is so many minutes away, and you know, this is your travel time, and this is what is going on, et cetera, et cetera. And if all this annoys you, you can turn it off. Right? You can just configure yourself. Not to, it tells you hydrocarbon stuff, right? if you so care. And then it does a little vibrate. So if you're sitting in your if you stop, and if you set it up on networktraveler.org, you said, yes, I do want to vibrate. Three days later, you're sitting in the bus. You're working on your laptop. And two minutes away from your bus stop, your phone will vibrate. Right? So what happens is that when you do this network traveler thing, it creates a little preferences file. And that preferences file migrates onto your phone. And that's how your phone knows what you've actually set up as your preferences. And it interacts dynamically accordingly there with the system in order to deliver to you the content that you actually uh, want delivered. And the other thing we've been, oh, this movie's not logo to play either. So the, so, yeah, so the, so the other thing that, that we've been uh, experimenting with is the idea of a virtual loop detector. 
So you can use your phone to let the traffic light know you're coming. Right? And I call this everybody's signal priority. Because it would be absolutely fantastic if you're sitting there late at night and the lights are red. There's nobody there, but you're sitting there. But you're sitting there just because it's on a cycle. Right? And so you just you can click a button on your phone. It'll tell the lights you're coming and turn green. Right? It's for cheap, instead of in installing detectors, etc., in the, in, the, in, in the pavement. And this idea, I think, has some traction. Because in the because it's 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 well established that flashing lights, which is what uh, departments do, just so that you won't have to sit there and say I'm the only guy sitting here, but I'm still sitting here, right? Uh, that's why they do flashing lights. Flashing lights are a lot less safe than lights that are cycling. There are many more crashes that happen at flashing lights. So this would be a cheap way of doing something like that. Yeah. Exactly. They, they call it transit signal priority. So that's why I call my idea everybody's signal priority. Okay. And, uh, okay. and finally, uh, and, and then you, know, you can also, if you want signage information, etc., it's, it's part of there is general awareness. The system's also aware of stop signs and speed limit signs. So we've set up a chime if you choose, you know, so if you're over the speed limit, it'll chime at you. If you so like, you can configure your chime, etc. And then it'll tell you about work zones. And then this is a particularly difficult one that, uh, that we are very interested in. And it's, this, oh, it's, it's, it's what we call the watch out for me part, the pedestrian part, where what you do is that you know, when you cross the road, you can send out a message using your phone. Right? So I can put a phone on my kid, and if he runs out onto the road, you know, it would be great if the phone would send out a message. Currently, what we've got working doesn't actually work for my kid, because what you've got to do is, is press a button on the phone in order to start sending out the message. What would be great is to be, you know, the version that would work for my kid is that, um, you know, that I just step off the sidewalk and it starts sending out a message, right? But making this work would need writing lots of papers because uh, the maps, you know, with the precision to tell you where the delineation of a sidewalk is don't exist. And GPS is also not that accurate. You'd have to fuse it with accelerometers and stuff like that. We did a lot of that for cars, but we haven't yet done all this for phones to be able to make that work. And then, you know, approaching drivers get messages if they signed up for this sort of stuff. So basically the idea is, right, and I'm pretty much going to stop here, that um, the, uh, you know, you get on this website, right, you sort of choose what information you want to deliver, and then uh, that's sort of the network traveler concept, which we see, see as sort of social networking for smarter mobility, in the sense that I'm only going to get pedestrian warnings if you agree to put it in. Right? I mean, and then the bus stuff, for instance, you know, getting GPS data of, of, of buses, if you participate in the bus application and you agree to send out GPS data from your phone, then other people get real-time data about the bus, making the whole thing of greater value to other, other, other people. So basically, the, the, the idea is, the social networking aspect of it is that if I don't put information in there, there won't be any for you to take out. Because collectively, we're, we're the ones who produce the information to make smarter mobility. So basically, the, my pitch is something like this. I'm still trying it out. Like, welcome to the world of the network traveler, an easy way to put in and take out information for smarter personalized travel. So get a smartphone and browse at networktraveler.org, and then put your phone in your pocket and go out in the world. Right? And a lot of interesting technical problems to make that work nicely, and we've done some of them. So that's really my, my, my last slide. So what, what will happen to DSRC VII? Right? So I think that you know, many of these information dissemination applications, like traffic density based on probe data and parking and accident reports and stuff like that, right, which are things I didn't talk about, but they're all part of it. We've got them all in Network Traveler. Uh, basically things that uh, will go to the mobile internet. Right? I mean, the mobile internet is showing up. Smartphones have 3G, Wi-Fi, et cetera. They're just going to happen. They're not going to wait for this 250,000 new network to be rolled out in the country whenever it happens. Now, safety. Right? So a lot of the justification for the new network and all that is safety, safety. Safety is the Department of Transportation's core business. Justifies regulation, justifies taxpayer dollars, et cetera, et cetera. Right? But in safety, we've started distinguishing between what we're calling soft safety and hard safety. So soft safety is more like situation awareness, where you, know, you, can, you, can, you can get a chime when you're over the speed limit. Hard safety is like, stop, you're going too fast, you're going to kill somebody. Right? So that's more hard safety. Now, if you're, going to, if, if, you're, if you're going to say something like that in a mean voice that grabs somebody's attention, then you have to engineer it to very high standards. Because there are enough field studies that have shown, you know, this collision warning stuff, 
based on radar, is 20 years old. The field tests on it were, you know, with 50, 60 people were done 10 years ago. And it, most of it is still not a product. And this is because of the nuisance problem. People turn it off. Right? Like, you know, if your thing tells you twice, and they're also afraid of liability. If this thing tells you, stop, and you really get so nervous that you stop, and then somebody rear ends you, right? You say, well, somebody's responsible. The stupid thing asked me to stop. There's no one in front, right? And so there are all these problems. And so, you know, that's why the soft safety business, where you make it situation awareness, you make it very gentle, it helps. Okay, pe people would say, does it help? Is its effectiveness compromised, right? But this is a new attempt to try and, to try and strike a new balance. The other thing we're trying to do here is we're trying to use learning algorithms, right? There's a lot of development now in the last several years in, 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 in learning theory. So we are actually, instead of trying to build an application which is one size fits all, right? We're trying to use um, biomimetic feedback to try and adapt it to uh, particular people. And then, um, and then, of course, you know, there's Wi-Fi into cars. I was saying that you know, now you put a smartphone in your pocket, you get into the car, it happens. And a lot of this ad hoc stuff sh may actually come to life in that way. So if I wanted to ad hoc car-to-car -car communication, maybe it's ad hoc phone-to-phone -phone communication and somehow over a Bluetooth link from phone to car. Right? And, uh, and then, essentially, now we have a new set of players, right? the mobile internet and the car industry. And a lot of this stuff that's been happening in this vehicular wireless space for safety in order, you know, ad hoc information protocols, hotspot protocols, et cetera, uh, maybe now needs to go into phones. And this cooperative collision warning, right, which we prototyped here, this remains a hard problem, and this is, this is really going to be local uh, communication. It's not going to happen over 3G. And this remains a very interesting problem, and it remains an interesting problem even at the National Science Foundation type of uh, research level. And uh, there's a whole bunch of papers that is mostly on the safety stuff. And finally, I just want to stop by thanking my collaborators that uh, a lot of the prototypes, which I guess you didn't see in the movies, or for those of you who could watch the screen, right? these are large research programs. We built the world's first prototypes and many of these things. And, it's a, and a lot of it is a result of a very productive collaboration between our civil engineering systems program and the PATH program, which has been a great service to the Berkeley faculty in order to make a lot of this sort of stuff work. And there's Professor Kanan Ramachandran at ECS, who's also been helping us a lot with the signal processing stuff. Very good. So thank you so much for the beautiful talk. I think we have a couple minutes for lots of questions if uh, people want to ask Raja questions about the talk. And we'll be passing mics around. We have two of them. I have uh, two questions. The first is that you are, you are, what you are saying by emergency of mobile commu internet to car seems like just the idea of use the mobile handset people have in the car because everybody has it. But I just uh, I just uh, immediately came up to me is that I think the 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 what matters most in the car is the interface, and that's why lots of car companies are putting lots of money to develop. Some device specifically for the cars because you know, simply you cannot look at the mobile phone in the car. So I just, you know, I just don't get what's the real benefit of, you know, using mobile phone in the car, except that people already have it. And the second point is that um, second question is that so it seems like the reason that it was such a delay in deployment in the US was the government regulated too much maybe? What do you, like what do you think is the factor that delayed, delayed the deployment in the US? I mean, it seems like you know, Detroit, people in Detroit do not have much money anymore, so maybe in, back in 99, if they let Toyota and Honda do their job, maybe the US could be a better place now. What, what's your opinion? Uh, okay, the second question is gonna get me into trouble. Uh, the, the first question, right, which has to do with, uh, I think, uh, you know, you take the mobile phone into the car. Um, well, you see, the piece that's left to the car, I think, right, is ultimately if I want to give people data, you know, about collision warnings or safety and stuff like that, I need to know the motion of the car. And the motion of the car is going to be known much better to the car than it's ever going to be known to my phone. 
right? I mean, I've dealt with this problem of how to actually estimate the position of cars accurately enough to resolve the lane, to resolve its you know, turns and things like that. And uh, you, know, you can do it. It needs a lot of sense of fusion in order to do it. And, it'll be, and so this remains a niche that the phone companies cannot enter, I think. Right? I don't know, maybe accelerometers and iPhones will get so good and it'll have so many gyros that it'll all work well, but I'm not sure of that. Okay? Um, but the thing is that, the, on the other hand, I feel that the, the box, I mean, this industry has engineered such beautiful boxes. I mean, I, I want to get rid of this thing. I mean, I have no, I mean, you know, I mean, this is so inferior, I think, compared to one of these boxes. It carries, it's bristling with modems. Right? And uh, I, I, I think that's its value. I, I don't think that even if you gave Detroit a lot of money, they would produce a better box that would be bristling with modems and that would be bristling, that would be engineered well enough to be an integration hub for various things. I can drive my car stereo system through this box. I mean, this industry understands, I think, how to interface, et cetera, et cetera. And, and which maybe gets to some extent to your second question. Right? That why this delay? And uh, this delay, I mean, just look at it, okay? A network with 250,000 base stations. Is that a big network or a small network as cellular networks go? I think it's a pretty big network, 250,000 base stations. So $100 million was allocated to prototyping this network. I don't think not even rolling out the whole thing, but prototyping it. And the money was, the bulk of the money was allocated to Booz Allen and Hamilton. And, uh, and there, was, there was no AT&T in the game. There was no T-Mobile in the game. There was nobody who had ever built and operated a big telecommunication network in the game. I think that's the main reason. And then people are, the other thing that, you know, which I think researchers like to do is, you know, you, you like to create a very carefully optimized solution for the particular problem you're dealing with. And this is the motivation behind trying to create those new standards that I was talking about, moving away from the Wi-Fi model. This is another reason for delay. That's my diagnosis of it. I mean, if it had been given to AT&T or T-Mobile, maybe it would have been different. But they don't historically have relationships with the Department of Transportation. That's why I was saying that this convergence is not a, not a simple thing. Do we have any other questions? One has to do with the privacy concerns about locating ourselves on the planet in, in real time. Um, and how much of that information is being captured by the uh, NSA or other folks um, here. And the second would be the cost of the consumer for this network as well. Can you say a little bit more what you, the cost to the consumer? Well, in terms of your, your net, the, the website that you go to, mm -hmm. so like a Easy Pass, are you paying a certain amount per month to access, access that site? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm not going to answer your second question uh, because the business model, we haven't yet figured it out. Okay, we are still trying to figure this out. It's going to be done on a prototype basis in this program. We are funded to demonstrate it in New York in November. That'll be the, and then there'll be a field test starting in January, right, with a limited number of people. And, you know, the bus stuff, for instance, that I was talking about, we've, uh, we're releasing it end of October for free on the iTunes app store, right? That's what we're doing. We're, we're releasing it there. Now, the safety stuff, we're going to start field testing in January, some of that stuff. And we'll see how it goes based on phones and things like that. Now, your first question about the privacy. Okay, so privacy, we've had a big debate about. And there are, of course, you know, there's the, uh, you know, there's sort of the encryption, authentication approach to privacy, right? Now, and, you know, a lot of people are playing in that space and it's valuable. So I've decided to take a different tack on it just for that heck really of trying, it's not that I devalue that, but to just look at it. I, I, you know, what I'm relying on is, I'm saying, I want to try network, launching Network Traveler with the following idea, that if it's consensual, people give up a lot of information. So, you know, I mean, the stuff that people put out on MySpace, I would never put that stuff out 
about myself, right? But people do it. So I'm thinking that you know, if we make it consensual, right, where uh, you agree to send out your GPS data, right? Now, if you know, the previous probe model was that you know, if you read the old probe data VII documents, they would be they would read like every car in the United States of America every time it passes one of those access points will send GPS data to the government, right? Now, once you do that, you have to have watertight, uh, you know, you have to make it anonymous in a watertight way, right? But on the other hand, you know, there's buddy tracking stuff that's out on websites. Um, it's consensual. If it's, and, right? And so that's the approach that I'm trying. And I want to see how far it goes. That if it's, you know, and, but of course we are doing certain things. Like, like, like the watch out for me message. When you're a pedestrian and you're crossing the road, that data is not archived anywhere. It goes out as an IP multicast message or as an internet packet. It's just routed to somebody else and it's lost. It's not cached, it's not stored, it's not forwarded beyond the land that you're in. Things like that. So we are doing certain things like that. And wherever it is cached and stored, like you know, when you like the bus application, the the company providing it, who are two students of UC Berkeley. Um, are going to cache some of that information. And you will be informed through the website of what they'll be doing with that. So we're trying that model. So I think we're at the end of the hour, so we'll have to stop here, but I assume Raja will be available for further questions and discussions afterwards. So thank you very much again. Thank you.